chapter 8, verses 23 to 34. Jesus heals two demonics. Hope I said that right. Jesus heals two people possessed with a demon. That's what we got. And if I look at the front of our book, this is the final unit, unit three. This unit is entitled Faithful to Heal. All right. uh, so far we have covered uh, Faithful to Serve, Faithful to Prophesy, and from the fifth Sunday going to the end of this month, our unit is entitled Faithful to Heal. Hey. And last week we looked at how Jesus healed a centurion servant. Yes, sir. And he said, Jesus, I'm not worthy to come out and meet you. I don't even think I'm worthy to have you in my home. All right. But you can just speak the word. <laughs> you can just say it. You don't even have to be there. Amen. And Jesus marveled. He said, I have not Amen. seen so great a faith as this. Amen. This is a Roman. This is a Gentile. Amen. I haven't seen this in all of Israel with my people. Amen. And now we're going to look at August the 7th, page 130 in our Sunday School books. Or you can turn to Matthew chapter 8, verses 28 to 34. Jesus heals two demoniacs. Demoniacs, demon possessed people. Hey. That word kept catching me off guard. So let's start. If you don't mind standing with me, let's have us a word of prayer before we go into teaching God's word. Father, we, we thank you and we praise you for being kind and just and good. Thank you for peaceful rest and early rise and all of the provisions you have made. As we look at what our Savior has done and to see the power and the love and the compassion. Father, we ask you to help us to realize and to understand that you have that same power even now. Amen. Father, we ask you to lead us as we walk through this lesson. Yes. Help us to understand it and rightly divide it. And once we understand these truths, to apply them to our daily living. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Matthew 20, excuse me, Matthew 8, verses 23 to 34. I'll go ahead and read this in our hearing. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea. Insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he, he being Jesus, was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful, O ye of little faith? Right. Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this? that even the winds and the waves obey him. Amen. And when he was come uh, to the other side of the country of Gad the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils yeah. coming out of the tombs, exceeding fierce, so that no man might pass that way. Amen. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Mm -hmm. Art thou come here to torment us before the time and there was a good, and there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils sought him, saying, If thou cast us out, allow us, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. Right. And he said unto them, Go. When they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. Amen. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Yes. And they that kept them fled and went their way into the city and told everything mm -hmm. and what was befallen to the possessed of the devils. Mm -hmm. Now you would expect a good reunion of people to come out cheering Jesus, mm -hmm. excited to see that he has healed two individuals and just thankful for what he had done. But when the whole city came out to see Jesus, and when they saw him, they besought him that he would depart out of their coast. They said, get out of here. Go ahead, Sister Ross. And, 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 and
certain torment they were just like old bad men that people were scared to go close to on them. And then to see all of that, but all of a sudden they just were peaceful, just able to walk and sit down. Like you said, it looked like they ought to be praising hallelujah that he saved. But like you said, again, it's all over against the house. Yeah, you, you would have thought, as you were saying, they would have came out praising God. Uh -huh. But they said, get out of here. Get out of here. Get, get, leave this place. Don't come around here anymore. Mm -hmm. So we can see the unexpected response, the foolish response. And our lesson mm -hmm. verses, uh, based on verse 23, is entitled, Followers of Christ. Mm -hmm. And we're going to jump down to one two, three, four. Yeah, it's got four paragraphs in there. And so what we see in verse 18 is, uh, excuse me, verse 23, it's an introductory verse. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Now, the first part of this uh, followers of Christ section, the first paragraph, between the events of last week's lesson and this week's text, a lot has happened. Last week's lesson was drawn from Luke 7, but Matthew has the same event in chapter 8 of his writing. Right after that, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law and healed crowds who came. Soon, however, he decided to cross to the other side of the lake in a boat, according to verse 18 of this chapter. Jesus' decision to leave Capernaum was presumably made because he had other work to do besides healing. Concerning the chronology of the four Gospels, each evangelist has specific purposes when deciding to include and exclude certain details or events. So you have to understand there is a crowd, according to verse 18 of Matthew, that was following Jesus. Jesus has been healing, he has been working, and then it says his disciples, they followed him. Now, his disciples, when it says this, sometime in the lesson, it refers to just the general followers of Christ. Right. This particular text, based on the context, is talking about the 12, including himself. Mm -hmm. And so you can see now all of them, they're leaving Capernaum. They're getting on a boat. The word ship in the Greek is synonymous with a huge, huge boat right. or a little bit small boat. Okay. It just depends on the context which one is described. Uh, we know it just had 12 people in it. So it probably wasn't a huge cruise liner. It was just a regular fishing boat. Probably one that belonged to the, one, of the, one of the fishing disciples that followed him. Then we get verses 24 and 25 of Matthew 18. And out of nowhere, it, that's why Matthew uses this word, verse 24. And behold, out of nowhere, there arose a great tempest in the sea, a windstorm. And the storm was so bad that the ship was covered with waves. And at the end of verse 24, as all of this is going on, the boat is rocking, waves are coming into the boat, waters in everybody's faces, clothes are wet, the boat is shaking and shifting, the sea is no longer calm. What is Jesus doing? He's asleep. He's asleep. Our lesson does go on to give us one reason why the lesson commentary says he was asleep. It just shows us how he trusted that God had full control of everything. Amen. Because he was God in the flesh, he knew that everything was going to work itself out anyway. All right. So instead of worrying and debating how we're going to make it, I know it's going to be all right. I may as well get some rest. Oh, yeah. Another commentary writer said, not only was he trusting the Lord and everything worked out, he's human as well as divine. He was also tired from a full day of ministry. All right. Jesus had to go apart and rest a little while. Now we can see the dual nature of Jesus. The hypostatic union. 100% God, while at the same time, 100% man. All right. He's just as much man as you and I, human as you and I, as if he had never been God. But he's just as much God at the same time as if he has no humanity in him. In the lesson, we can see he speaks to the elements and everything instantly stops. 
at the end of the lesson. And he can speak to demons that are possessing a man and force them out of them into a herd of swine. He shows his divine power. But as a human, he's tired. As a human, Jesus slept. As a human, John 11, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. <laughs> As a human, he did what? Ate food and drank water. As a human, if Jesus were walking and slipped and hit his knee on the ground, it would cut the skin. He could bleed just like every one of us. But as God, he can calm the seas. He has power over nature. He can walk on water. He can heal incurable diseases, one of which was leprosy. He can cleanse a leper. He can raise the dead. Amen. So we're seeing the dual nature of Jesus. Amen. Verse 25. And his disciples came to him and they woke him up. And they said, Lord, save us. We are about to die. Now, what do we know about many of the disciples that followed Jesus? What was many of their occupations? Fishermen. Many of the occupation was fishermen. And being on the water, being experienced, being an experienced a mariner, a fisherman, you would think, well, they've seen stones over the years and decades. But for trained fishermen, all of them were not. I think six to seven of them were. But for fishermen, who have seen the ups and downs of what the water can do and the wind and the waves. For them to be at a point to where they think they're going to die, this was a serious, serious situation. Yes, now, let's, let's make some application. Jesus is on the boat with them. All right. Jesus is in the boat with them. All right. And a storm still came. All right, let's, 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 let's go ahead and enlarge that point. We can be, let's just use the analogy, on the boat with Jesus. So we'll say we can be obedient, loving, devoted Christians that read the word, we pray, we worship at church, we raise our children to love God's word. But guess what can happen to you? A storm can still come. Amen. Now the other gospels tell uh, the parallel story that there were other little bitty ships with Jesus that followed him to the other side. Probably some of the large groups of people that were with him, seeing him heal people that day. If they're having this problem and they have Jesus in the boat with them, if they feel their life is in danger and Jesus is right there sleeping at the back part, behind the part of the ship, and they can go get him and wake him up. If they have Jesus, and they're having a storm, I wonder what's happening on the other boats. <laughs> now, now, just think about that. You think about, as we kind of make the illustration flesh out, you think about how difficult things can be in our lives, and we got someone to lean on. How in the world are those without Christ trying to cope with the storms of life when they come. Some of them drink themselves to death, smoke themselves to death, party themselves so they lose all their money and all self-respect or whatever coping mechanism they have. Because the Bible says it this way, it rains on the just as well as the unjust. For a Christian or for someone that does not follow him and outright rebels and rejects him, guess what? You're going to have some problems. But the blessing is for the Christian, we have someone that we can lean on. Amen. We as Christians have someone who can help us through the storms of life. Whether it be the death of someone you love. Right. And you can hear the preacher say, ashes to ashes, yes. dust to dust. Right. Well, there's nothing more than you trying to get ahead, save money, and, and, and provide a future for yourself and your family, and you lose your job unexpectedly. Yes. The loss of finances, the loss of job. How am I going to make it with next month's financial obligations coming in? Because let me tell you, energy doesn't care that you lost your job. <laughs> U.S. Bank does not care. You, you, you name the list of people 
that we owe money to for daily living, they're not concerned that you're having a hard time. They're still going to send the bill in the mail. We have these problems. We have someone that we can lean on, that we can stand on these precious promises. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, even until the end of the world. They that wait upon the Lord. Did you have something, Sister Ross? They that wait upon the Lord. They shall renew their strength. You, you, you can find your encouragement, your strength in what the Bible says. Imagine trying to go through these things and you don't know any of those things. You know nothing about the Bible. You don't know what prayer can do. You haven't experienced the grace of Christ or the love of Christ and you're just trying to handle it on your own. Good luck if you're on those other little ships. I, I, I have to go ahead and tell you, you're not going to make it successfully. Mm -hmm. There is nothing, sometimes God can allow a situation to come our way to prove to us, to validate and confirm to us that you can't pay your way out of this one. No, 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 no. You, you, you can't maneuver your way. You're not smart enough to get yourself through this. It's going to take someone outside of you. Amen. And I'm so glad that here we can see these 12, they have Jesus in the boat with them. Right. And the good news is, do you know what's worse than not having Jesus in the boat with you? Let me tell you what's worse. Having Jesus in the boat with you and you don't turn to him. That's a waste. <laughs> you, When you don't turn to the Lord, listen to me, you prolong your pain. You prolong what you're going through in the storm. You may not feel like it. If you've ever been in, you ever been in a rush and got in traffic and tried to find a little shortcut to get around, get off the freeway and all this other stuff. And before you know it, here you is taking side roads and taking another alleyway and all this stuff. And if you just would have stayed in the freeway, you would have got there quicker. If you just would have stayed the course, don't feel like it because you're not moving. You're just going a few feet at a time. And you think motion is progress. Just because you're moving and doing stuff doesn't mean you're making any real progress. So to have access to the Bible, to have access to the promises of Scripture, to have access to prayer, to have been to church and heard the Sunday school lesson and seen and witnessed what he can do for you, what he has done for you, and to say, I think I'm going to do it myself. To have him on the boat and don't turn to him. That's foolishness. Why, why, why would you not do that? Have we ever seen an example of that in young people? Who you try to give them the benefit of your wisdom. How you made a mistake when you went left and you should have went right. Here's what you should do. Oh, just if you just save for a rainy day, because I thought the way you thought, I it went into my pocket and I spent it. I found out that's not the right way to do it. That's not beneficial long term. And you tell them and tell them and tell them. And what do they do? The exact thing you said, don't do. To have access of someone who has life experience, who has seen the power of prayer, who has been at the bottom and you saw what scripture can do, what God can do to get you back on your feet. And then try to tell that to someone that's coming behind you. And they say, I think I'm okay. I'll do it my way. That's foolishness. You see, experience, people have said this phrase, experience is the best teacher. Amen. Not all the time. No. Sometimes the ex sometime experience can be the teacher of a foolish person, mm -hmm. especially when somebody has already experienced it mm -hmm. and telling you that that's not going to work and telling you here's an alternative route that can be much better to save you from the lumps and bruises that I went through. And they still say, well, I'm going to do it myself. Okay. <laughs> so to have the Lord and to not use him would be an all-time tragedy. But one thing we see in verses 24 and 25, the disciples, his disciples, came to him. He was asleep at the end of the first 
uh, 24, so verse 25, they had to wake him up. And they said, Lord, save us. We are about to die. The water is coming into the boat, and the boat cannot hold much more water. Can you wake up and do something about this? Verses 26 and 27. And he asked them a question, verse 26. What's the question he asked them? What are you afraid of? Oh, ye of what? Little faith. So you see the connection between a lack of faith and the increase of fear. A lack of faith. Lack of faith. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is not a question mark. Faith is not crossing your fingers, closing your eyes, and just hoping and thinking maybe it'll work out. It's not a blind leap in the dark. Faith comes by hearing, hearing what? And hearing of the word of the Lord. Faith is a trust, a belief that what God's word says is actually true. Faith is the trust and dependence and relying on the truth of what God's word says. In their case, when Jesus said, let's go to the other side. Well, that's your indication right there. We're going to get to the other side. Why? He said, let's go to the other side. So they woke him up. He assesses the situation instantly. And he said, why are you all afraid? As if I'm unwilling and or unable to handle this situation. You come to me as if I am powerless to do anything about this. You come to me as if there's nothing that can be done. Now just think about for a moment in your life. Maybe there was some situation to where you know beyond the shadow of a doubt. I only made it through that because of the Lord. You, you, you know that, that there's no way you made it through that, we're going to say storm, difficulty, crisis, tragedy, traumatic experience. There's no way you got through that had it not been for God and His grace pulling you through. We ought to look back and his history in our lives All right. and couple that with what his word says about his provision and protection and grace and love and when a current situation comes the same God that brought me through the 60s All right. the same God that got me home from Vietnam Amen. the same God that got me through another crisis and you just name them on down He's the same God that can get me through this now. Amen. And then you can have the faith of those young Hebrew boys in, in Babylon in, in front of Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, Even if he don't get me out like I want him to, it still don't make me think he ain't able to do. He has a greater purpose in mind. So the point is, Jesus said, listen, don't be so fearful. That, 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 that doesn't mean that we don't recognize the danger. That the stakes are high. Yeah, you, you, you recognize it. You recognize it. But there is something in you that says God did not bring me in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and can't do nothing about the storm. Right, right. When we were looking to, to do a church, y'all would be amazed at what the banks would do to us. Mm -hmm. Maybe not intentionally, but the numbers are so low. We don't have the capital of some of these other large churches building houses on the cities. And so some of them, in order to not tell a church no, they would just make the requirements so high. Right. There ain't no way in the world you can meet that. One baby question told us as we were in the for the ride. They gave us this paper, boy, they had the fancy words and spreadsheets. And I said, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. can I ask a question? And I'm thinking in my head, this can't be what it looked like. Are y'all saying that before y'all give us some money, 
we got a first half of a million dollars of our own money? I said, I, I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. And I said, and I, and I, had, I wanted to be nice. I didn't want to burn no bridges now. You know, want to make, I said, now, I'm not trying to be funny. But if we had a million dollars in the bank, we wouldn't need y'all money. <laughs> but, and as you go through the, you think it's going to happen, and it falls through. You, you think it's going to happen, and it don't happen. And it's discouraging. You recognize how they're treating us at this place. You, 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 you recognize what they're doing, putting padlocks on the bathroom doors and losing them. You, you see the inconsideration, I'll say, in this. But there was something in me that said, God, I just don't believe that you will allow these circumstances to take place outside of our control. And in two years, you never hear the people. I just, that there was something, that, even though I recognized the stakes were high, I just couldn't let myself, allow myself to believe that it wasn't going to, I don't know how, don't, don't know when, don't know what he's going to do, but I just know too much about God that he won't bring you this far just to leave you. Amen. And so he said to them, why are you so fearful? You of little faith. Then he arose, he stood up. Rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Our Sunday school lesson, I'm going to make sure I find it here. And we're looking at verses 25, 26, and you know, even 27. The Sunday school lesson kind of tells the geography about the Sea of Galilee. Yes, indeed. How it's so many hundreds of feet below sea level, and there's a warm air couple down there. And it's flanked by large mountains on the sides. And sometimes the cold air from the top of the mountains would roll down and bump into the warm air below sea level. And a storm rose just like that. So when the storm rose, that's why it says in verse 24, and behold, out of nowhere, storm, there arose a great tempest at sea. Amen. They go to Jesus. No one better you can talk to than Jesus. Go to him with your concerns. Go to him and tell him thank you with your joy. Praise him when he brings you out. Amen. They take it to Jesus. Amen. Jesus has to give them a slight correction. The reason you're so antsy is because you have a small amount of faith. The reason you're so fearful is because you're not completely trusting me the way that you should. Now let me give you another reason of why you should have faith in me. Right. He stood up and he rebuked the winds. Uh, he rebuked the winds and the sea. And the Bible says there was a great calm. Now you have to understand this. This was not Jesus said a word. The storm stops. The cloud moves. And the sun come out. And walks near a rock and it's taking a while. No. This was instantly. The storm, winds, they all stopped. The clouds moved away, and even the sea was still. That's why it says there was a great calm. And when you look at the next verse, verse 27, the men around him, they were amazed. They marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, that even the winds and the what? Sea, the waves obey him. So it wasn't just everything but the waves and the boat still rocking because it takes a while for the water to get settled. No, he stopped all of it. He completely set everything in order. He completely put everything in order. But the real storm was not the storm at sea. The real storm he was trying to calm was the storm that was in their hearts. Amen. Amen. The real issue wasn't that the boat was taking water and they're about to drown and they're afraid. The real issue he's trying to resolve is the issue in their heart that was unresolved to where they didn't trust him the way that they should trust him. All right. You see, that's the real victory. The real victory is not having the wind and the waves stop. What, what happened to the boat and the water? I don't know. The same way the wind and the waves stop, I bet you that water wasn't in there no more. The sea was calm, but Jesus did all of that, not just so that they could see he's got power over the elements, 
But the main reason he performed that miracle was so that when he spoke about who he was and what he could do and what he would do, they had evidence of his power to say, oh, he'll do just what he said he would do. He can do it. He does do it. Now listen, that's hard. That's, that's, that's hard. The only way to learn that truth is to go through something. That, that, that's, that's the only real way to learn that truth is to go through something. The, the only way to know that he can really truly do it. You can read it and you can get so close to understanding it. But when you've been through it and you can call them <laughs> and you say, Lord, I need you. This is real. This is not a test. This is not faith. And when he pulls you through, now I know that I know that I and the point being, we can learn things about God in the valley, in the storm, that you just don't learn in the mountaintop. There's some stuff in the valley, there's some stuff in the storm and the rain. These lessons are not the same lessons you have on the mountaintop. So now, Jesus said, they say to him, what manner of man is this? It's like, we, 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 we haven't said, oh, oh he's, real. he's real. He's real, I know. Matthew 8 and verse 27. And the men marveled, they were amazed. And they were saying, what manner of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. All right. And the blessing wasn't just for them. But remember, the parallel accounts tell us there were also other little ships. So the same blessing they got is the same blessing that other people got that didn't even have Jesus on the boat. And so Jesus calms the storm. And they make it to the other side, verse 28. And when he was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils. They were coming out of the tombs, which lets us know that's probably where they were residing and staying. Exceedingly fierce, aggressive, so fierce, so aggressive that no man will even come past that way. Don't, don't go down that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, what do we have to do with you, Jesus, thou son of God? They know his true identity. Yeah. They know exactly who he is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I want to make sure it says that the two men. Now it says possessed, verse 28, with devils. The actual word is demons. There's only one devil. There are many demons. But the actual word should be demons. It says devils, not kings, James, James. But these fallen angels who were in heaven. These created angelic beings that sided with Lucifer, who degenerated into Satan and is now the devil, sided with him in a losing battle to go against the Most High God. And they fell with a great fail, fall. They knew exactly who he was. All right, all right. They knew enough to know, as they say, what have we to do with you, Jesus, thou Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time has run out? Because we know our time has, it will run out. We know we only have a limited amount of time to do what we're doing. We know ultimately we are going to fail. So are you here early? We thought we had more time. Jesus, thou Son of, uh, Son of God. They recognize a couple of things theologically. They recognize that Jesus is not just a man. Mm. Oh, he is the Son of God. They know more than the high priests. They know more than the elders. They know more than many of the Jews in Israel at that time. They recognize who he truly is. He had to convince so many people. The demons didn't even convince enough. That's Son of God right there. And they also recognize that one day their time will be up. And see, you would ask a logical question. If Satan knew 
when he was in heaven that you can't win against God, but he still tried it. If the demons knew that you can't win against God, but they still sided with Satan, and they all got kicked out of heaven, and if they know and understand that there will come a time so they will be cast away and done away with. You would say, well, if you know it's going to end up in a loss, why would you go forward with it in the first place? Well, I guess each one of us can ask our question. That's the root of all kinds of sin. If you know that there is no happily ever after when it comes to sin. If you know that rebelling against God, God is undefeated. And you or I will not be the first one to give him a loss. If you know it's going to end up in failure, in loss, in some way, why do you get involved with sin in the first place? That's what's called the foolishness of carnal living. The foolishness of worldly living. Like I, I, I've talked to some people that were doing stuff that shouldn't have been doing. And I said... You know you're gonna end up in jail or killed doing this, right? Like like you you know this you're not gonna to go to 70 years old and retire from selling drugs on the corner. Like you you, you know there's no retirement plan. You're gonna end up in jail, you're gonna end up dead or strung out on the stuff you're selling. Anyway, since you know these are the eventual outcomes in some way, why would you do this now? Because what Satan is a master of is he'll tell you you can have your cake now. And he'll still let you know you're going to have your crumbs later. But people will still cash out right now knowing that what they're doing is not going to win. I, I heard some young people, you know, I'm going to be like Scarface. I said, Scarface died at the end of the movie. Like, what? What's good with this? Like, what? But you can see the foolishness. How many of us, when we were younger, said something that wasn't true? How many of us did that? I know, I know. Nobody wanted me. Did, did you eat them cookies? Like you got chocolate chips all over your mouth. No. <laughs> did, did you wash this dish when you gave it to? Hand dry as a bone. Yeah, I watched it. You, you, know, you, you know some of the stuff that kids will say that don't even make no sense. They, they get caught on the spot and they give you a story that don't even make no sense. I remember when I was 18, you know, the big thing was calling in to work. Because you don't feel like, but you, got, you can't just say I don't want to come in. You'll get fired. So you got to make up a good story not to go in to work. And I mean, I worked at Pizza Hut. I said, I can't come in today, Milton. And he said, why you can't come in now, right? Come on, little cousins and pile them up, they get abused, and I gotta pick them up and bring them under the rock. He busts out now. He said, I'll tell you what, right? Go take care of your family when you get back to Little Rock, you ain't got no job no more. <laughs> he, he laughed, he laughed. I bet he was like, that's the best he can give me, you know. He said, take care of your family when you get back to Little Rock, you ain't working here no more. Then I had to go to work. <laughs> but the point is, you can see how the end of a certain thing. It's empty, it's foolish, you're not going to win, but you do it anyway. That's the x ray to every scene. Like, you you really think, uh, years ago, I remember, boy, taking money from Kroger from the register. And we're like, all they going to do is add up the register and find out you're taking $5 here, $10. Why do you keep doing it? I don't know. And what they do, fire them just like they. But that's the x-ray of every kind of sin. Looking back now, you were like, oh man, that, that, that's so foolish. But in that moment, you still press on anyway. And guess what? They knew who Jesus was. Have you come to torment us before time? Verse 30. And there was a good way off from them, a herd of many pigs or swine, feed him. So the devils asked him, if you cast us out, allow us to go into the herd of swine. Now, now what they're doing is they're actually testifying to the authority of Jesus. They said, if you do get rid of us right now, could you put us over there? 
It, it's a way of them recognizing he is in complete control. So much so that we have to get his permission on can we go over there when you get rid of it. Don't just destroy us. Can you put us over there? In a negative way, they recognize he's in complete control. But the disciples on the Sea of Galilee were fearful and had a small amount of faith because they didn't recognize that he was in complete control. They, he had to show them again who he truly was. With these demons, they knew he was in complete control to the point to where they asked his permission. If it's okay with you, send us into that herd of swine that's feeding over there. Verse 32. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine. And behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished into the waters. Jesus, de Jesus demonstrates his authority, as I said, over the powers of darkness. One theologian says that the herd of swine were unable to control the demons inside of them, or it wasn't a good fit, so to speak. I'm not, maybe using the wrong words. And they violently ran down into the sea, and, uh, to the Sea of Galilee, and they died. Well, the people that were watching this, they went inside the city. They said, oh, we got a story to tell you. They can tell about Jesus, tell about the conversation, tell about the two demons possessed men, tell about the demons going into the swine, swine into the sea of Galilee. And in verse, the last verse of our lesson, they came out. The whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they asked him to leave. Well, wait a minute. Well, no mention about the two men who were demon possessed. Now they can have a normal life. They don't have to live in the tombs. They're not fierce. They can go back to their family or start a family, get a job, Go to church. Follow Jesus even. Their only concern was on their loss. Not on what Christ has gained for them. Their concern was that man, that, which lets us know these are Gentile because a Jew could not own swine. That's an unclean animal. Of course, Christ was not bound by those ceremonial laws. But these were Gentiles, not Jews. And they said, get out of our coast because the cost for you being here is higher than what we want to pay. So we would rather have you leave. We see you as a liability and not an asset. Now you think about that. The cost for Christ coming into the picture was more than what they wanted to pay. Whatever the herd of swine would cost them in money or whatever it cost them to sell them or to cook them or whatever and make money from that, that cost that they would have made is now gone. Even though you have Christ in your life was higher than what they wanted to pay. And so this takes us to a fundamental point. What is your threshold? What cost are you willing to pay for your love, allegiance, connection to the Lord? Because salvation is free, but serving the Lord is going to cost you something. It could cost you a friendship. Your life has changed. When you begin to implement biblical principles, it's going to adjust everything in your life. When that glass is full to the top and you put one ice cube in it, all the water moves. The glass is full. You put one ice cube in it, the water flows. Everything around it changes. When Christ, who can be like the ice cube in your life, it's going to affect everything else. And the effects that you have to go through, the cost, would you give up a friendship for Jesus? That's been your friend your whole life. But now, 
when you come to Christ and as you grow in Christ, you see characteristics in them and, and you, the stuff that they want to do, you don't want to do that anymore. The way they handle things, you don't handle it that way anymore. The way they talk about people, you don't, you don't want to be involved in that. And so you keep hitting your head against the wall. Are you willing to sever ties with a friend for the cost of embracing Jesus? Because when Christ comes into your life, some branches of your tree have to be pruned in order for other branches to grow. You cannot have Christ in your life and everything stays the same. Nothing changes, nothing is shifted, no way you handle stuff is different. That's an impossibility. That does not happen. And so as you grow, as you mature, you have to make some tough decisions. Why? Because you lead and handle your children differently. Your, your, your marriage is modeled differently. How you handle anger and offenses is different. The, the morning message, we're going to look at how Christ, how he had amazing restraint. And how that's hard to do. Because it's hard to be humble when you're right. And people are doing you wrong. That, that, that's hard to shut your mouth. But you know how the Bible says, yeah, there's certain times you need to speak up, but there's other times you just shut your mouth. But I don't want to shut my mouth. But I want you to be quiet. But I want to tell them. I don't want you to say a word. The way you handle anger, the way you handle your money, you're a steward now, not an owner. You realize it all belongs to God. What cost are you and I willing to pay to have Christ come into our life? Or if he's in our life, to have him have more free reign as we grow, to have more maturity as we mature and grow. What is your cost? Jesus said it this way. I tell you what, if you love, let me say cousin. No, I don't say cousin. Fraternity brother? No, no, no. What if you love your husband or wife? No. If you love your mother and your father more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Jews in the first century that would come to know Christ as Savior in a Jewish family that did not recognize that he was Lord would be disowned by their family. Mom and daddy wouldn't come to you no more. Brother and sister, if they were considered good Jews, they would not associate. You would be disassociated from your own family for having your hopes of eternal salvation placed on the cross of Calvary on Jesus Christ. That's a heavy cost to pay. I was watching a documentary yesterday about this cult. And the cult, it was Mormonism. And it was, they were so strict in what they believed that if a person left their little compound, they would take those kids and give them to another family. They would take that wife, if it was a husband who left, give her to another man. They would instruct them to never speak to you again. And there was a woman who was telling her account when she realized that, I forget the guy's name, but he was a cult leader at the time, was sexually assaulting a little girl. She said, no, no, no. And she left. And there are people still to this day, she got eight kids that wanted to see her. She saw the cost of getting away was so important to her. It, it hurt, she said it with tears in her eyes. She, she said, my eyes have been open. I was taught that from a child up. We were secluded from the world. No radio, no TV, no phone. We thought everybody else was strange. Had hair that wore their hair a certain way, same kind of clothes, everything. Man got four, five, six wives. One guy had 60 something wives. No telling how many you. And she came out of that at the expense of having a relationship with all the things she said, eight of her kids. And that hurt her. My point is, at what cost do we say, Lord, no matter what this costs me, no matter how much this hurts me, I know this is what you want me to do. I, I, I know your Bible, your word says, here's how I'm supposed to handle this situation. And I have to handle it, but if I do, there's going to be backlash. Has anybody ever had backlash from doing something that you know was right from the Bible? Anybody ever experienced that? that that's, that's difficult. 
Because what it does is, it puts you where there's no wiggle room. You either want to be like these uh, swine herders and say, leave Jesus, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm going to keep living the way I've been living. I don't want to have nothing to do with that. Or you want to embrace him as Lord and Savior. And so this is what it means, the cost of discipleship. As Jesus was heading into Jerusalem for one of the last times, had a whole bunch of folk following him. And he said, in essence, they don't quite realize what's lying ahead. There, there's bloodshed for me that's lying ahead. He said, if you want to follow me, you can follow me. But you have to deny yourself and take up the cross. And then you can be a follower of mine. Now, when Jesus says, take up my cross, we're not to interpret that on how we think today. You're to interpret that literally on what he was saying then. The cross didn't mean in laws. The cross didn't mean funny looks on the job when you pray over the food. The cross didn't mean, well, you could have got promotion, but you talk about the Bible too much. So they'd rather have somebody else in the high offices. The cross meant death. Crucifixion. Jesus was crucified on a cross. What he was saying to them, if you want to follow me, you don't follow me just through job laws and sickness and relationship laws. You follow me if it costs you everything, your freedom or your life. Let me say something. Because we try to lower the standard, the Bible still hadn't changed. Because we try to water it down, God's standard still remains the same. And I can tell you, there are countries right now you better not say the name of Jesus. Oh, it's going to come literally at a cost to your life. That's strange to us because we in church, we streaming now. We got people in here. We got microphones and perfume and cologne and crosses on our lapel. But there are literal places right now that where if we did this, our life would be in danger. Now, would you still come to church? Would you still want to worship? What happens is the higher the cost, what it does is it, re it separates the sincere from the insincere. And so Christ here, in essence, he shows a, well, the people, not Christ. He healed two demon-possessed men. You would have thought they would have hugged his feet and fell down at the ground Worshiping him, thanking him for delivering these two men. They didn't see what he did as an asset. They saw what he did as a liability. And they told him, I think we've had enough of this. We're, we're done. So we can see this story how Jesus healed two individuals possessed with demons. I'll look at a couple of our practical points on page one. 38 of our Sunday school lesson. It says faith in Jesus and we talked about this number one, does not mean that storms will not come. <laughs> it gives you a, it gives you peace in the midst of the storm. Amen. The second one, there's no reason to fear as long as Jesus is with you. He said that on the ship. He said, why are you so fearful? Practical point number three. Even the devil and demons recognize and is subject to the power of Jesus Christ. Right. That is absolutely true. Number four. Jesus has authority over everything. And we don't need to be influenced by the world. Amen, somebody. Amen. And I want to look at the fifth one. We'll stop at this one. Jesus is the embodiment of peace and deliverance. That's when the city went out and told everybody, let me tell you about this man, Jesus. And when they came out there, they said, leave. But Jesus is the true embodiment of peace and deliverance. We make it to the, the 
end of our lesson. We'll go ahead and we'll stop right here. And what we'll do, let's have